as I mentioned, this is our monthly virtual tour. Uh, today, we're excited to have some special guests with us. Every month, we like to show you guys a look behind the scenes at our Waterloo Park construction and talk about different topics of our project. So thank you for being with us. Um, if you'd like to tell your friends about it or share with your networks, we do this series monthly and you can visit waterloogreenway.org um, to see our next event and find out how to subscribe to that. So thank you again, we're, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna introduce our presenters today. Um, our lead presenter is our director of planning and design, John Rigdon. And we are joined by our special guests today. Um, we have our colleagues from DWG. Um, we'll be hearing from Eric Schultz, Cassie Gowan and Kyle Grist who are working on our project and we're so glad to have them today. So thank you and I'll turn it over to y'all. Great, thanks Melissa. Um, so I'm gonna start by sort of set, setting us up and providing context for, for what we're doing along Waller Creek with the Waterloo Greenway project. So Waterloo Greenway is a 501c3 uh, nonprofit that's in a public private partnership with the city of Austin um, to redevelop and build uh, parks along Waller Creek on the eastern side of downtown. You can see Waller Creek in white in this image um, and Waterloo Greenway uh, in green. In total, that's about 35 acres of new and restored public open space on the eastern side of downtown. So, uh, you know, just to the west of I-35 and from 15th Street down to the lake. Um, this, pro this project is the result of an international design competition in 2012 um, and really builds kind of on the back of the flood control tunnel, which was built from 12th Street to the lake in order to remove uh, a lot of this area from the floodplain. So the city council uh, reached out to our founders and asked them to put together um, an international design competition uh, to select um, a design team to execute a vision for this area of downtown to create this park system. Uh, that process was, uh, you know, extensive throughout 2012, as I mentioned, and the selected design team was led by Michael Van Valkenburg and Associates and Thomas Pfeiffer and Partners. MVVA is leading the, the landscape side and TPP leading the architectural side. In addition to that, they had a, a you know, ton of great local partners, including uh, the folks joining us today for our presentation, DWG, who's a landscape architect, a local landscape architect on this project. This work is executed in phases. It, it's a really big project, as you can tell. So we're not able to do all of this at once and we'll do it um, over a period of years, phase by phase. And so if you look at this diagram here, I've kind of switched the orientation on you. Now north is to your right. Um, and in the bold orange is Waterloo Park. And that's gonna be the focus of our tour today. However, you can see there's additional phases of work that are ongoing. So if, if folks have joined us for Creek Show in years past or other great events that we host in our in Symphony Square, like Free to Friday. Um, we have the Symphony Square space, which was kind of our phase zero and our office space that um, we completed last year. Um, and future phases include the Creek Delta, uh, which is from 4th Street down to Lady Bird Lake. And then we're gonna meet in the middle after that. In total, uh, Waterloo Park is 10 and a half acres. So, so on its own, this is a really sizable park. Um, you know, for a regional comparison, it's about the same size as Discovery Green in Houston. Um, so this park in and of itself will have a really big impact and add a lot of park space to downtown Austin. Also worth noting within the park, um, there's more than a mile of ADA accessible trails uh, and all the green spaces you can see, as well as a world-class uh, amphitheater for performing arts and music. And we'll talk about all these features as we move through the park. So here's the vision at night. This is a, a rendering from years ago. Um, and you can see it's situated in downtown right next to the Capitol. And we've got this great event happening uh, in the Great Lawn in the park and the Moody Amphitheater. And you can see that, you know, it's all lit up. Here's what it looked like in December, the end of, the end of 2019. You can see we're, you know, we've just starting to come out of the ground. We've done all the underground utilities. We've built this flying lawn structure. You can see the left there. Uh, and the walls are starting to go up to the amphitheater. And here's a shot taken just a few days ago. So we've come a long way. Um, you know, it really starts to take shape when you see the grass go in. It really looks like a park now. Um, and again, you can see, you know, it's it's really critical location on Red River, on the Red River Cultural District, positioned near the Capitol and kind of right in the heart of downtown. So let's go. We're going to move through the park and, and follow along on a series of tour stops 
since we can't all be there in person, we're going to do the next best thing. And I'll show you where we're walking through the park virtually, and then we'll stop and see a number of photos and talk about some of the key features. And, you know, we're very lucky to have DWG involved on this on this meeting because they can provide a lot of really interesting insight and detail uh, about the work, about the design, as well as the, the construction process to certain features in the site. So I'll pass it over to those folks to share added information and details on certain aspects of the tour. So we're going to start at the at the entrance to the Moody Amphitheater. So 14th Street Bridge, where you can see that dotted line, will be one of the main entrances into the park. You'll cross the, for, the historic 14th Street Bridge over Waller Creek, a restored Waller Creek, and enter into this uh, opening into the Great Lawn and the Moody Amphitheater. This is what you'll see as you as you cross the bridge and enter into the park. So you've got Moody Amphitheater um, with the you know, beautiful canopy in front, and we'll talk with in greater detail about that, uh, the lawn below. And then, um, you know, if you turn to the right, you'll see uh, these buildings. And one of the things we wanted to do when we were designing this park is we got a lot of community feedback and feedback from our, our great partners in the city of Austin, particularly the Parks and Recreation Department on this, on this particular issue. And, you know, Waterloo Park has a history as, a, as an event space. Uh, it hosted festivals, 5Ks, 10Ks, uh, community gatherings, events, all types of things. And our community in general um, loves music and events uh, in our public spaces. However, as we you know, got a lot of feedback and talked to our partners, we love the events, but we don't love the negative impacts that events can often have on parks. So, you know, in, in some parks, you can have a great festival or event, then you have to close the lawn, close the spaces and let the, let the park heal and, and, the, and the grass repair over weeks and weeks. And a lot of that has to do with bringing in a ton of temporary infrastructure. So one of the things that we focused on was building a building uh, into the hillside uh, with green roofs and occupiable roof plazas that housed all of that uh, temporary infrastructure. So here you're looking at the concessions and restrooms building on one side of the amphitheater. Here's a slightly different view. You can see, you know, it is a very active construction site as you can see with all the um, equipment there on the ground. But the curved wall on the left houses all of the concessions. Um, during a big show or event, we can open all of those up and we'll have a concessionaire serving food and beverage. Uh, during normal park mode, we can open one or, or open none and close it. And this just can be a nice plaza that people can walk through. To your right, you can see restrooms. So we have restrooms, permanent restrooms, able to support a show of a capacity up to 5,000 people. And again, those can be opened or closed as needed. Uh, so we don't have to bring in all of these portable toilets um, and concession tents and other things, which can have those negative impacts on the park. Here's just a, a cool shot with a view into those into those concession spaces. On the left, you can see that curved concrete wall and curved concrete doors. Those will be opened and then there'll be concession carts which slide into those slots. And then to your right is the walk-in cooler, uh, which will support um, that concession space just a you know, kind of behind the scenes peek at what the concessions look like. So moving a little bit further into the park, we have the lower lawn. So we call this whole area the Great Lawn, with a large open lawn space. And one of the cool aspects of, of this design is again, because we have that permanent infrastructure um, that will not be impacting the park is we wanna be able to have a, a show or a gathering community event one night, and then the next day we can reopen it as a, as a lawn space um, that you'll be able to, you know, walk your dog, throw a frisbee, put out a blanket, and enjoy a picnic. So the lower lawn area is one of those spaces. So, so during a show, you could imagine temporary seats on either side of this pathway filling this space, and then off in the distance where you can see uh, a member of our construction crew standing on stage, that's where your performer might be for a show. And in order to keep, um, you know, this lawn green and lush and enjoyable for visitors um, throughout the year, it's not just about keeping all the heavy equipment off of it, but it's also a story about how we manage water um, and keep the grass well watered and also uh, meeting our sustainability goals as a project, how we uh, you know, store and clean that water and reintroduce it back into the creek. So with that, I'm gonna pass it to uh, Kyle from DWG to talk a little bit about our cistern and stormwater management system. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, this is a, uh... It's a really interesting um, setup that we have here. Um, and on this graphic you see um, on the screen now is um, kind of the location of the cistern kind of at the base of the lawn there. Um, that 
cistern is uh, sized up around 50,000 gallons. Um, so it's going to be collecting stormwater uh, from the adjacent surfaces and then also from the, the venue structure uh, roof um, itself. Um, and it uh, is going to collect that water and then eventually pipe it over to a series of rain gardens over on the uh, south end of the project. Um, and those are those are going to be functioning as kind of water quality devices for us, um, cleaning the water, um, essentially uh, pollutants and debris and, and, and stuff like that before it, uh, it eventually will be percolated down through the soil media uh, and then put back into uh, the creek, uh, hopefully a whole lot cleaner than, than it was when it, when it got into the cistern. Um, John, if you want to move over to the next one. Uh, here's a... As you can imagine, that 50,000 gallon cistern is, is quite large. Um, it's kind of a photo of uh, the excavation that was happening during that. Um, with the creek uh, being pretty adjacent to us, we're, um, sorry. Sorry about that. Got a call on my phone here. Um, uh, excavation here, um, going through some limestone um, and that, that uh, a piece of equipment there, um, kind of grinding away that, that stone so they could get the cistern down into the lower levels. I'm gonna move on to the next one. So here's a shot of uh, one of those rain gardens over at the south end of the project. Um, it's, uh, these were just recently planted and looking really great right now. Uh, next. Yeah, and uh, here's kind of a nice aerial shot looking down at, at those three rain gardens. Um, in, in sequence, they're kind of at different elevations. And so um, as water is pumped out of the cistern over to these areas, it has the ability to flow through from, from one rain garden down to the next one uh, in, in series. So you kind of uh, out a little bit of a, a treatment train um, going down to the final lower one before it kind of makes its way into the, into, back into the creek. Next. Great. Thanks, Kyle. Um, and, you know, this, this just shows, uh, like this image, because you can see that that cistern is hidden kind of underneath where this pile of pavers are over here. And you'd, you'd never really know it was there, but it's doing a lot of work to help treat this water and, and manage storm water as well as, uh, you know, the water we use to, to water our, our, the grass on site. I'm going to talk a little bit, too, about this structure uh, you see here, the canopy in the, in the Moody Amphitheater. Um, and, you know, what this structure is doing is, is a number of things. One, you know, we think it, it provides this great kind of structural object in the park, which can be a real focal point, a gathering point, um, you know, something that you'd tell your friends, hey, hey, come meet me uh, at the Moody Amphitheater Canopy. Um, and, you know, the other thing it's doing, obviously, is providing uh, rain and sun protection for the performers who will use the stage or for folks who will use the stage just, just to hang out during the day when the park's open. So here you can see one of the cool features is, you know, we have the stage obviously, but we also have a stair and a ramp connection up to the stage that makes it ADA accessible uh, for use during uh, non-show times. So I like this because it's good to see that it's being used for its intended purpose. Um, here's folks on the construction team who have, you know, without us prompting them, uh, decided to use it for its great intended purpose of a shaded spot to enjoy lunch in the park. Um, so, you know, they've, they've moved their, their lunch space to here. It provides a great area to keep socially distant while eating lunch because it's big and open air and shaded, and it has that rain protection. So you can see up here in the roof, there's essentially a skylight system of, of glass panels uh, that provide rain protection while still allowing that nice kind of uh, dappled trellis sunlight to move through all these different uh, beams. Another view of that roof. This roof will also do the work of supporting all the infrastructure to put on a large concert, um, dance performance, theater, anything like that we might have in this space. So there's a, a grid of, of structural steel up there, which will support the speakers, the, the large format screens, uh, the curtains, anything else that an artist may wanna hang in order to put on a great show. Um, you know, a, a fun fact about this roof, and here's kind of a, a glamor shot, um, there are five miles of uh, six inch steel I-beams. And you can see all those stretching out at different layers uh, within this roof structure. It creates this really cool and kind of cloud-like tree canopy-like shape um, over, over the, the stage and over the entry from Trinity Street. 
you can see here uh, at its widest point, I believe there's 12 layers of this steel. And so you can see uh, as this was being installed, how all that stacks together in this sort of crisscross fashion in order to provide kind of that trellis like effect that you then can see kind of on the stage here. And then this is a more recent shot, kind of a little preview here of the of the canopy roof at night. So it's lit up here where this is kind of our standard nighttime lighting. Um, during a show, obviously there would be spotlights and, and different, um, you know, colorful lights, LEDs, all that type of thing. Um, but, you know, this shows you kind of how it has that cloud-like look even in the evening. Um, I'll also, you know, take this opportunity to uh, plug our Creek Show event this year, which is more of a uh, swing by kind of drive by Creek Show where we'll be doing some really cool things with lighting of the canopy. So more info on that on our website and on social media, but a great opportunity to kind of get your maybe your first in person uh, peek at the structure. Uh, we'll make sure you can't miss it with the cool lighting effects we'll be we'll be putting on it. And then here it is during the day. So, you know, you can see, you know, the lawns in, the, the canopy is providing that great shade. When the park's open, you can imagine dozens of park visitors sitting up there enjoying their lunch uh, and hanging out in the lawn down here. And then this was the vision. So you can see, you know, we're getting really close, but kind of the last step here uh, is putting the vines on the walls. So these walls will have vines that grow up them uh, and make sort of a greener space. Uh, also, I like this image because you know, we've got all these kind of shrubs and wildflowers in the lawn. We're going to cut the lawn, so it, it won't really look like this, but it provides a nice image of, of how you can enjoy this as a park space. So moving forward, we're going to take a little detour out to the back of the lawn and talk about one of the really cool things that we've we've done on site. Um, you know, this, this park has some great existing heritage oak trees, uh, but it has a lot of open spaces um, that were essentially just dirt. Um, from years of construction, predating our work, but also during this construction. And so we're planting hundreds and hundreds of trees. Um, however, you really can't replace that great day one shade. So one of the things that we've done on site wherever possible um, is accept tree transplants from, from other sites, from, from partners, um, from neighbors, from adjacent developers, from the state, uh, from UT, and then move them on site in strategic locations so we have that great day one shade. And this is a big endeavor. It's costly, it's challenging, and requires really great coordination by our design team. Uh, and DWG has been really essential in, in the success of this program, uh, where we've relocated eight, you know, great trees on site, and many of them heritage heritage live oaks. So I'm going to pass it. Um, I'm going to pass it to Eric to talk a little bit more about the tree transplants that we've done on site, and two in particular. Thanks, John. Hi, everybody. Eric Schultz here from DWG. I thought I'd talk a little bit about our heritage tree program and uh, the tree transplant. As John mentioned, um, there are eight tree re relocations, and uh, we've got one large signature tree, which I'll show here in a few more slides from the Capitol Complex. As many of you probably know, the Capitol Complex is undergoing a renovation. The new Irwin Center uh, replacement is being done at UT and so be able to work with our community partners um, to, to obtain these great assets and really from a design perspective, how we celebrate trees, how we, how we have large trees, we were really lucky to, to get these and, and have these be a great design element and effect in the, in the park itself. Um, there's a lot of planning that goes into this. Um, you know, the park is essentially under design for many, many, many years. And then we have to think about sequencing. The time of year trees are moved usually is best between December through February. So how can we sequence the best time for survivability and success rates? How do we deal with logistics of construction access and things? So this is an example here of a, of a move where this tree was prepared off site, craned onto a flatbed truck, driven into the site. Next. And as um, we think about these things, depending on where they are in the park and construction sequencing, they have to kind of go in an order of uh, operations through uh, access and, and building the canopy and, and things like that. You can see here in this image that there's a lot of other large equipment that needs uh, to be used. John, if you want to go next as well. Got a little bit of delay on my end, about 10 seconds on slide advancement. So, um, but the great thing about these trees is they really add a lot of scale. John mentioned shade, and that's a really important aspect. 
uh, to the project because as you all know, in Texas, it's hot. We use our, our sites during the day and, and almost as much during night and how they can also compose space, how they can compose views as well as provide habitat benefit. Next. So the, the great thing about this as well, and we all come out to see this in person, I hope pretty soon, on the south side of the site, we have a large stand of existing trees that were preserved. We did as much tree preservation as possible. And by bringing these in, I think you'll, if you can identify them, trying to understand which trees were actually there when the park started, and then which of these large trees uh, came in after the park was under construction. Uh, this image here shows probably our largest tree transplant. This came from the Capitol complex, about three blocks to the west. And this device here is a very specialized device used to move extremely large trees like one of these. But essentially we, um, or EDI, our, our tree moving uh, contractor bundles this tree up, puts it on top of this transporter, drives it down 14th street, turns corners. In these situations we have to take down temporarily traffic signals and, and power poles to get under utilities and then those things go right back up and then we just park it in its location lift it up pull this transporter out set it gently back down and then back infill with compost and soil next so as you all come out to the site i hope you try to look around and and see is this tree was this tree here was this tree moved and and hopefully you'll see how how great the composition is uh, on the park when it finally opens up to everybody thanks john yeah thanks eric and and you know this shows one of those trees we were just showing just the other day in its final location and you know we're we'll, we're definitely going to work on some way of, of messaging and sharing information so you can be on site and see kind of the history of these trees and where they came from. But as Eric mentioned, they become great design features. I, I think they're also great moments of collaboration. You know, the, the state, the city, a nonprofit, UT, adjacent developers all working together to save some great trees and make a better park. And we really look for those opportunities wherever we can. Um, and, you know, bring those challenging ideas to our great designers like DWG and, and say, help us figure this out. And so that's how we're able to, to logistically bring these trees on site and make it happen. Um, so now kind of walking back uh, into the building, I'm just gonna give you guys a little bit of a sneak peek at the backstage area. Um, again, you know, one of the big goals of this was to build as much as we could and, and permanent infrastructure to support events and shows so that we wouldn't have to bring in all the temporary equipment. And at the same time, limit the areas which are closed uh, to public use. Uh, and we've, you know, we've done that by putting this building underneath the landscape. So this building is tucked into the hillside. It either has a green roof or a accessible plaza on top of it. So you're walking on or enjoying plants on top of the offices, the artist dressing rooms, the VIP rooms. The space is gonna be outfitted as a really great amphitheater that the artists will love. So we've got six dressing rooms, we've got offices, we've got a green room, um, we've got a, a flexible space, which could be used as for VIP events or community activations or children's events, really trying to maximize the flexibility and minimize the impact on general park use. So I like this photo because it shows um, a much earlier uh, photo of this image as we were building um, the roof and you can see all those really cool, uniquely placed columns. Uh, you gotta deal with them when they come through the building. And so we were able to navigate, our architect was able to put walls in place here, which turned that kind of uh, space with many columns into a series of rooms uh, that house those offices and dressing rooms. So here you can see the stage is just out to your left behind this curved concrete wall. And then all these offices and the necessary equipment and utilities are squeezed into the space. Here's another shot um, from the loading dock area, showing down that hall with the stage to the left. This building also has three loading docks, which will be able to accommodate load in and load out of all the equipment and keep that out of the park. So the park you know, can be used as a park while we're loading in all the vital equipment to put on an event in, in the amphitheater. Um, so moving along, um, you know, as we move through the park, now we're kind of passing through one of the main entrances into the park off of, off of Trandy Street. Um, through the Meredith Plaza, and then we'll touch on the family pavilion and go to the Deal Booth Promenade, which are all kind of nestled in this area on Trinity Street in the southwest corner of the park. 
the Meredith Plaza is this great deck around two beautiful existing heritage oak trees. And as Eric pointed out a minute ago, kind of the, the tree story of the site really informs a lot of the design. Um, these trees are some of the oldest and largest on site, and these beautiful um, kind of sculptural trees really set a major entrance into the park and provide shade and a real experience for park visitors to sit under here on temporary seating, uh, enjoy food, just enjoy the park. But, you know, getting this done and keeping the trees healthy and everyone safe is a big challenge. And I'm going to pass it to Eric again to talk about exactly how DWG and the rest of our design team managed to get this beautiful deck so close to these really precious trees. Yeah, thanks, John. As I mentioned, with transplants and a lot of work uh, going into planning and prep preparing those, um, I think this probably has double or triple the amount of work going into tree preservation. As I mentioned, there's a lot of preserved trees we have on site, and obviously these two are the signature preserved trees. And so there was many, many arborists, um, consultants, PARD, private arborists, um, and a lot of work done in these preservations through sonic imaging, um, uh, which is essentially like taking a, a CAT scan of the main stem of the tree to understand decay and strength. In the design process, this image here shows we scanned the trees with a LIDAR survey equipment to obtain a three-dimensional representation of the major branching structure. We used air excavation to understand where the major roots are around the critical root zones to really inform all of our planning decisions about how we design and work around these uh, these two significant assets. Um, in doing that with all of our consulting partners and our arborist partners came up with a, a structure system that was uh, malleable as we find um, roots in terms of the structure process of installation. And so what I mean about that is we define all where our structure piers are going to be and then we use a method of air excavation and vacuuming to vacuum out the soil where, where our pier is going to be going. If we encounter a large root or, or um, structural roots for these trees, we can slide that over and do another air excavated hole with the, and vacuuming out that so we can strategically be placing our structure around these root systems to provide as little um, disturbance as possible. Um, next, John, you want to go into some of the construction photos? Uh, in addition to this, back in, I don't know, 1940 or 50, um, the city had trenched about five feet away from the main stem of these trees and put in a humongous storm line uh, back in those days. So we had to design this deck also to be open and access for any time that the city might want to come back and do any maintenance procedures on. But you can see in some of this construction photo how the steel structure floats above the existing ground. Um, so all the structure relies on these piers versus it just being ground pressure around these trees here. You want to talk a little bit more about this, John? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Eric. And, you know, I think one of the really exciting things, you know, to see on site was the process of putting this together. And I just like these photos because they kind of very physically represent all the work that Eric just highlighted that our that our team did to design it. And then, you know, our contractors did to put this together. So you can see kind of that, what looks like a very odd and, you know, uneven system of, of supports really achieves all those different goals that Eric just outlined so that we can bring people close to these great trees to enjoy the shade while keeping these trees healthy and safe over the long run. And, you know, you forget about all those things like utilities. And I'm glad Eric brought that up, that our other real key coordination points. So we're, you know, adjusting to mistakes of the past, providing um, access to keep those things working and trying to correct for the future and keep these trees healthy and accessible to everyone. And so this, this really gives you a sneak peek of what that, how it all comes together. And then we see this great deck. So, you know, jumping forward, um, you know, right next to this, and part of the reason for the deck being in place is, you know, when we were designing the park, we really wanted a, a food element to the park. Um, and, you know, we, we want people to be able to come out to the park and, and, you know, not just play or walk through a garden or see a show, but really be able to enjoy a, a full day in the park and, and have all the things they need in order to do that. And so originally in our design concepts, we had a cafe building in this location. 
Uh, it was going to be a beautiful cafe, serve great food in the park, have some indoor and outdoor seating. Um, and, you know, through a process of community engagement and feedback, um, we went, went out to the community and asked, you know, is this the right thing for the park? What are your, you know, wants, needs, desires for, for food? And what we really heard overwhelmingly was uh, cafe is not the right choice. It, it feels expensive. It doesn't have a lot of options. Um, you know, it might not be good for my kids. And so we, we heard a strong preference for food trucks. Um, and we listened to that and adjusted course. And, and where we ended up, I think, is, is better than where we began. Um, we ended up with two slots for food trucks, which is kind of on either side of this building. And then this great family pavilion, we call it, which serves all the other functions uh, other than preparing food. Um, this has three unisex restrooms, a storage room for program support and other things we may need in the park, as well as a trash room uh, to store uh, garbage, recycling, uh, compost from these food trucks. And th this building was a, a great uh, you know, collaboration between our, our members of our design team, really led by Michael Shue, Office of Architecture, who's a great Austin-based architect. And they came up with this beautiful family pavilion to achieve those, those goals. Um, I'll show you all a few photos of it. It's, it's a really cool structure. Um, you can see it's concrete and follows sort of a, a similar material palette as the, as the amphitheater, but has its own kind of unique characteristics. You can see the three restrooms, unisex restroom stalls on the left. Um, and, and, and then on the right, you can see the uh, storage space. In the middle, covered up by uh, plywood right here, is a really cool sink. One of the things that we, we heard, again, working with our partners and getting community feedback, and you know, we went to other parks around the country and talked to the folks operating them, and we heard that oftentimes the kind of you know, backup, the line for the restroom, particularly on family spaces, isn't necessarily just to use the toilet. A lot of the times it's for hand washing. People get muddy, they touch things, gross things, they are dirty, and you need to wash your hands. And so understanding that there's more hand washing than bathroom use required, we pulled the sink out of the bathrooms and put it in the middle of the space. So more people can wash their hands more quickly um, and people can still use the restrooms. And so here's a close up of that. Uh, it's a unique cast in place concrete sink um, with, you know, you can see these really cool kind of terraced features and it can be accessed from both sides to kind of maximize the hand washing space. And then there's, uh, you know, hand dryers on the wall. Um, you know, this, this is even more important now that, you know, we're, we're in a COVID world going forward and, you know, people will need to wash their hands more and stay clean. So this allows people to do that um, more quickly and, and more easily. And just another cool example of collaboration with the community and our partners. And then here's a shot of what it looks like just the other day. You can see the building. And then here's kind of an image of, you know, what it will ultimately look like. So two food trucks. These won't change every day. They'll kind of be short-term or long-term temporary uh, installations. But, you know, the cool thing is we can highlight different types of food, different food vendors, um, and the barrier to entry is much lower um, than having to be an operator who can operate a big park cafe, and we can switch things up as community preferences change. So a really cool example of collaboration right adjacent to that great deck, which you can see kind of in the foreground here, the image. Um, moving a little further, a little further on, um, you can see the building that we were just looking at, the pavilion down the left bottom corner. And then we're going to talk about the Deal Booth Promenade, which is this beautiful snaking elevated walkway, which moves its way through the park. Here's a view of the structure. You know, one of the, the biggest challenges and opportunities from a design perspective on site was the grade, the elevation changes more than 50 feet from Trinity Street on the right over to Red River, you know, which would be off screen way to the left. And a goal for the overall program was universal accessibility. So that goes beyond just your standard ADA accessibility. We want to have a single pathway that can, uh, you know, achieve uh, access for people of all mobility. So we don't want to have wherever possible an elevator and then a stair or a steep path with a switchback ramp next to it. Uh, we want to have a single pathway that achieves all those goals. Um, and this is one of the really great opportunities that came out of designing in that way is to navigate that elevation change. The design team came up with this elevated bridge-like structure, which navigates the tree canopy and brings people accessibly from that high spot over into the amphitheater. So here's a view as it kind of works its way through the gardens. And here's a view walking on it more recently. And so you can see it has handrails, so it's safe. 
and it works its way kind of above these garden spaces. So you can just imagine the great views down into the playscapes, the garden spaces, through the trees, out over to the amphitheater. People will stop and enjoy that, but it's also mobility. Uh, it moves accessibly, whether that's, um, you know, strollers, wheelchairs, walkers, uh, pedestrians. Um, maybe slow moving cyclists can move accessibly through the space and have this you know, great experience in the park. The structure itself, you can see here, is a unique um, kind of curved bottom uh, uh, concrete structure that's post tensioned. So a very challenging uh, engineering feat by the engineers on our team. And then for the landscape architects, really thinking about how you place these, these columns strategically to avoid pathways and also really kind of blend into the uh, plantings and environment around here. So again, kind of the goal, the vision is this will look like it's a floating walkway through this beautiful lush garden space. And you can see kind of on the right here, you'll be able to sit in these great benches underneath there, enjoying some shade from the walkway, but also seeing folks walk above you, walk in front of you, and really increasing those interactions in the park. I like this shot because it kind of shows the the complexity that goes into making this type of structure a reality. Um, you can see the blue post tension cables, and you can see all of the you know work that goes into supporting this rebar cage and making this curve structure happen. And in order to get that curve, we had all these unique um, you know milled foam panels, which served as the bottom of the formwork, and this uh, you know cage sat on top of, and the concrete's poured in. So really, um, you know, a great collaboration between all members of our team to create this really cool effect. So moving forward a little bit, we're going to stop in the Kitty King Powell lawn. We call it a lawn, but this is really a great area for play. Um, and, you know, here's a rendering of what it will ultimately look like. And we're, we're pretty close to this, as you'll see in just a minute. One of the goals for the project, again, working with the community and with our partners in the Parks and Rec Department, uh, as well as our design team, was a nature-based play approach. So, you know, really, you know, a familiar playground might have swings and plastic slides and very brightly colored climbing equipment and things like that. We wanted materials that were more natural, blended in with the surrounding environment and kind of served as gateways into more engaging play that might happen in some of the adjacent natural spaces. So with that, uh, I'm gonna pass it to Kyle from DWG to talk a little bit more about some of those play features in the park um, and how it all came together. Thanks, John. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm out on site um, several times a week. And so it's been really interesting to see this part of the, uh, the park really kind of come together. Um, and it's really, um, and that's really happened over the past like month or so. So it's really exciting to see this area uh, kind of come to closely to that, the rendering that we're seeing. Um, there's several different play kind of options in this area. Um, and as as John kind of touched on, one of the things that the, the design team from Michael Van Valkenburg's office was looking at was, um, you know, how to how to include um, be have a very more inclusive play. I think more people, more kids, able to use um, use the equipment uh, or spaces and experiences, and that's one of the things that you don't quite get um, when you have um, stuff like traditional play elements like swing sets, um, you know, or take up kind of a good chunk of area and not very many uh, kids um, are able to use them at one time. So these areas, while um, not very large in, in the overall space of, of the park, um, actually has quite a large amount of area for uh, kids of different ages and, um, and sizes to kind of be able to enjoy themselves. Um, so you'll see kind of in on the right here is this little uh, guy called the Mega Grass, um, and in the background, uh, straight in front of us is um, I don't know if that one has a name actually, John. <laughs> but uh, we call it, we call it, we've decided we're gonna call it the the log jam, the, the log climber. Jam. Fair enough. Um, uh, and both of these structures are uh, are from a uh, a company based out of Germany. Uh, they use um, wood that's kind of been sustainably sustainably harvested. Um, and um, and we're kind of resistant to um, the overall effects of um, you know bugs and pests and and whatnot, um, and put together and um, and then and sent over to us. Um, and they uh, the company's called Richter, I believe, um, and they have a lot of really great, really fascinating looking things. Um, and these are just two examples of 
of the two uh, of, of their entire collection. Um, and then the other piece of the, this area um, is this uh, really awesome stone slide. Um, it's, um, it was milled out of, uh, out of granite, uh, CNC cut um, to have this shape and curve that was very carefully studied by MBVA. Um, and in this progress uh, shot, you'll see the stone slide there in the middle and then in um, some other stone features around the edges of it um, where uh, one of the workers is standing on the left is gonna be a set of stairs that kind of takes you up to the top so that you kind of can you know do a bunch of hot laps you know up and down um, so this whole area is going to be really awesome and um, and right adjacent to this um, is another one of those transplanted trees that's providing a lot of great shade for for this area um, for families um, and kids alike so uh, you want to next one yeah there's a, there's a good shot of that um, I'm gonna hang, move, move over to the next one. I think there was a great shot of the aer aerial shot of that hole. Yeah. Um, yeah, this kind of is just, uh, it's a really great shot from, uh, from the bridge looking down into that space. Um, and that, 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 that log structure in, in the foreground is looking really cool. So um, anyway, thanks. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah, and as Kyle pointed out, one of the cool things too is you see the limestone block on the right you know, that's where parents will be able to sit and keep an eye on their kids and enjoy some of those great, the great shade from those heritage oaks and, and maybe some food from the food trucks, which are kind of right underneath us over here. They're really trying to stitch all that together so you can hang out here for a long time and not get bored. So, uh, yeah, we're going to move forward a little, a little bit further um, and jump into the Hill Country Garden. And I'm going to pass it to Cassie here in just a minute to talk about the planting and kind of how we, how we put that together and some of the cool features. But one of the really cool ideas behind this Hill Country Garden is, you know, it's right next to the play area and has all these great heritage trees and kind of corners and bends and pathways. And so what the design team looked to do was how do we connect this to the play area? So maybe this can be an extension of the play. And so the, you know, kids see the traditional climbers and they know, oh, we can play here. And they see these pathways, these scrambles as we call them, which is the stone stone pathways in the ground here and they're for exploring so you can kind of run through the garden and this will all grow in and be pretty dense and you can you know hide and run and chase each other and really enjoy that kind of immersive play experience uh, you know similarly you can just walk through these and enjoy exploring exploring this beautiful garden space uh, one cool feature just to point out a fact I like about this stone scramble as we call it is this stone was actually a waste product in the quarries it's kind of the, the cast offs of, of limestone used to clad buildings you know, residential and commercial buildings. And there's just piles and piles of this. So our design team identified this and said, hey, we can use that if you, you know, bring it on site and we'll, we'll pay to transport it. And then we can use that to create these great pathways. So another way we're trying to be sustainable, but also create these, these cool new features. Um, you know, and with that, I'll pass it to Cassie to talk about um, what we've done with the plantings in the Hill Country Garden area. Hi, thanks, John. Um, I was gonna talk a little bit about just some fun facts uh, about the park and how many plants are brought into the park and how many trees. Um, I'm just gonna round up, but in just Waterloo Park, there's close to 50,000 plants um, that have been brought in and then close to 500 trees. So it's, it's a lot of plants um, and it takes a village to get it all put together. So um, go team, everyone is awesome on the project and we're, we're uh, working hard to make it happen. Um, in terms of the planting, I think um, it's been a big collaborative effort between MVVA and the Wildflower Center, DWG, the city of Austin has had a lot of input in what's appropriate and what's not what's going to thrive and um, work well with others. So really, I want to say um, the one approach is that it's a big plant party. <laughs> um, the, uh, the palette is mostly native, I would say probably 90 to 95% native. And early on, probably, I want to say two or three years ago, we started coordinating with MVVA and 
local nurseries to really carefully select all the plant material, the trees, and then there's a, a lot of species that have been carefully, really carefully contract grown. A lot of species that are unique. You, um, you wouldn't normally find them in a, a, a typical landscape around here, but really some very cool natives. And um, I think it's a, a great way to demonstrate the use of native plants to the public. Um, it's a, you know, uh, something that we, we need to encourage the city to, to celebrate and use native plants. Um, the garden is gonna be really a pollinator heaven. It's gonna have a lot of hummingbirds and early on um, before the park was sort of under full construction, I uh, found a little fox in one of the heritage trees just sleeping in the, in the, um, in the tree and I felt really sorry for it because it had no idea what was to come. But now we're starting to see, you know, as the job site closes down at night, I'm seeing a lot of um, animal droppings. So creatures are finding their way back in. Um, but anyways, the, uh, the design approach for all the plants is really low water, resilient, tough as nails. Um, and I could I could talk more about it, but uh, you you can just keep going. We can talk more about specifics if anyone is is asking. And I saw a question pop up about plants and the uh, the root ball. These pictures are sort of dis deceptive. Um, there there's a huge VSPZ zone where there's no plants, so um, those are those root balls are really carefully worked around. Um, in the rain gardens, I think one thing that's really interesting about the rain gardens in this park is that, you know, typically they might be seen as a, a sort of back of house infrastructure, but in this project, they're really celebrated and amplified and they're, um, you know, they're a huge, huge part of the, the project, but um, here they're, they're designed to be quite beautiful. And um, yeah. Great. So thanks, Cassie. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, um, and you know, just one other thing I wanted to touch on, and I'll kind of move quickly through these last slides so we can make sure to have time to answer DWG folks have time to answer some of your your questions. Um, you know, this is another cool feature. You know, just uh, we have these benches sort of uh, bent into the elbows of these trails moving underneath these great heritage trees. Um, and, you know, this is an older photo, obviously, before the plants were in, but ultimately we envision it looking something like this. So you have these great seating areas around these beautiful uh, existing live oaks, and then the, the plantings that Cassie described will, you know, be kind of what you look, what you look out at, what you can run through on those pathways and really enjoy uh, this very hill country garden kind of pumped up um, in this corner of the park. So last space that I'll touch on is the Leberman Plaza. Um, you know, one of the things that we, we also got a lot of feedback on was, you know, not all activations, events, programs are going to be, you know, a thousand people or more, like, you know, feels comfortable in the, in the Moody Amphitheater space. A lot of them will be smaller um, and maybe informal even. So we have this space called the Leverman Plaza, which has, you know, the power necessary for, uh, you know, speakers and, you know, what, whatever other very high demands you may have from kind of a, uh, a three-phase power um, system as well as water um, and it has these seating areas on the stone and can be seated on the flat area as well. So this space could have smaller smaller activations, kids programs, busking even, and is really centrally located so you can kind of look at it uh, down from the pathways above and get that experience where it really pulls you in and you want to see what's going on down there. So you know there's a lot of small spaces which also are supportive of that overall program and this is one of them. Um, I'm going to zoom through some aerial views here and then we'll get to questions. Um, so it's kind of the helicopter tour, uh, the quick version. So you can see down on the lawn, you've got the, the lawn, which is totally in and is, is doing a great job establishing. Over here on the left, I'm going to highlight those two transplanted oaks that uh, Eric was touching on earlier. You can also see how the building is tucked into the hillside and has either a green roof or it has a plaza roof on it. It's occupiable. So really all that back of house stuff disappears. 
Um, you can see that elevate or that elevated structured lawn that I mentioned earlier. We reclaim about a half acre of, of park by reaching out over the flood control tunnel pond uh, with this deck, and then we're able to plant trees and have a lawn on top of it. So kind of achieving many functions at once. Moving down here to the southeast corner, another great transplanted uh, oak tree from a developer just across the street. Another example of great partnership. This will ultimately be a major trailhead as you move here and then down under a bridge into the southern portions of the trail system. Uh, here's an aerial view of the Hill Country Garden. You can kind of see all those all those specks down here, all those plants. And then we've got these great existing uh, uh, trees on site. And you can see the rain gardens as well over here in the Leverman Plaza. Here's a good shot that shows all those paths coming together and, and the existing plantings. And then a view which I think really highlights the Deal Booth Promenade here as it kind of meanders its way through and makes those grades work. So you can get a really good sense of how you have to come from all the way over here on the left at this low point, all the way over here to the right, and if you just went with a straight shot, it would be way too steep. So this is how you get it done. And it creates these really cool experiences and views of the park. Um, you can see the family pavilion here. The food trucks will be here and here. And then the Meredith Plaza around these beautiful oaks. And then you can see how this major entry into the park will come from underneath uh, the canopy of the Moody Amphitheater and into the Meredith Plaza. Also, you can get a good view here of that uh, skylight system providing rain protection. And then finally, uh, the restoration of Waller Creek from 15th Street. You can see all that happening right now to help further uh, cushion the impacts of floods and restore this, this uh, you know, degraded section of the creek and also create a beautiful experience as you look from the 14th Street Bridge. And so with that, that is our tour. And then we'll, we'll happily take questions from that Melissa has been compiling. Thank you, John, and thank you to the DWG team. It's so fascinating to hear those details of the project and it's really exciting for us to be able to show it off to you all. Um, we have been getting a lot of questions. Um, we have a few, John, related to the venue and the cistern. Um, and we have, we have a question about um, how the cistern will integrate to our irrigation system. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? And we also have another question about when there's not rain, if the cistern is also collecting runoff. Yes, and I will, I will kick this one to Kyle to provide more details, but the cistern is always collecting the groundwater from the site um, and filtering it through that system. So Kyle, can, could you speak a little bit more specifically to what happens and how that integrates with the, with the on-site irrigation? Sure. Um... The, the cistern um, is only serving as a water quality uh, collection device for runoff, essentially. Um, it won't be filled with um, water um, during the rest of the time because um, it needs to be, uh, be able to be open and clear for uh, the next rain event that comes through. Um, the park itself is actually um, using uh, reclaimed water or auxiliary water from uh, the creek or the lake. Um, that is being pumped from the flood control tunnel just adjacent or within the park. Um, and so 100% of the irrigation for the park is gonna be auxiliary or reclaimed. Um, no domestic water is gonna be used. Um, there, there's a backup system uh, for the times when the, the flood control tunnel is, being, is down for cleaning. Um, and that'll come from the uh, a reclaimed water uh, line that runs around the city. Um, so yeah, and, oh, I guess, um, Sorry, the, I think there was a question also about um, uh, like sediment buildup in there. And that's definitely something that we uh, was a major concern and con uh, consideration when we were looking at the, the cistern design. Um, there's several hatches in the, in the surface of it. Um, and so it's not really easy to see them uh, in the photos, but that's because the, these hatches are, uh, have concrete uh, inlays to them. So they, they kind of blend in with the rest of the paving around them. Um, but there are several hatches in there that can be opened up um, and it can be uh, vacuumed out and serviced, um, you know, every every couple year or so, however often we need to do that um, to make sure it's clean and, and ready to, to collect water for the next storm, so. Thank you, Kyle. Great. Thanks, Kyle.
Um, we also have questions about um, those great, beautiful trees that we have at the Meredith Plaza. And Eric, it was really interesting to hear about those scans that you were showing us. We have a question about how old those trees might be. I don't know if anyone has an idea of that. I know, I know that they've been in the park for a long time. <laughs> Yeah, Melissa, I mean, it's, it's thought that they're at least a couple hundred years old. Um, there was, you know, four sets of different arborist teams working on this, two from the private side and two from the city side. So we had DSD or City of Austin Arborists. We also have part arborists. We had Davy Tree doing a lot of analysis and then another um, very highly specialist um, uh, arborist from Germany who was doing a lot of work up in the canopy and doing some other assessments. So, you know, hearing from these professionals about the age and about how we're um, working in and around these trees was a, was a huge asset to us. I, I saw maybe Lisa, glad you're on the call today, ask a question about planting in the in the root ball itself, or maybe somebody else. I think Judith had mentioned about uh, irrigation and. Um, on the particular transplant trees themselves, um, there is an irrigation system within the root zone. Um, it's a drip irrigation system in concentric rings that is constantly monitored and, um, and uh, specific volumes placed on these root balls uh, to keep them going into an establishment period where those roots can grow back out into the soils that were placed around them. Um, we move trees as much as we can in the winter time um, when they're more, uh, when is most appropriate, but then in a construction site, we've got 100 degree days, they really, really need supplemental water to survive. In fact, um, there's a high probability of survival rate for transplant trees up above 90%. The, the, usually the failure is the, the supplemental irrigation system has been broken. Um, so the intent is once, once a lot of these plants, including these trees are established, um, they won't be regularly irrigated because the planting design and planting palette is meant to be mostly native. And therefore, once they're established, um, don't necessarily need much water, but we can turn it in in times of extreme drought and use auxiliary water there. In terms of planting in the root ball, Lisa, you may have seen that picture up on the flying lawn. On all the transplant trees, there are no shrubs planted in those root balls. Um, it's just around the perimeter. So if you were referring to maybe that image, it might've been a little deceptive on the screen, but um, all the existing transplant trees that have come to site are just uh, covered in organic mulch. Thank you, Eric. That's really helpful. Um, we also have a question, Cassie, this might be um, one that you can help us answer. We have a question about how we will handle invasive species and weeds. So could you tell us a little bit about that or if anyone else wants to add? Um, I. I've been in some of the conversations with the, the maintenance side of things, but I'm probably not the, the best person to answer. Um, you know, it's gonna be a much more um, maintained park. So a lot of these, um, it's, it's more of a garden than a park. That is, um, but it's also a very wild and woolly garden and some, you know, some weeds are probably okay. As far as invasives, we, we definitely don't want those, especially, you know, around the creek. So those will be managed. Um, but um, I think in general, it's, it's meant to be really wild and wooly. And um, like, if some weeds come in, that's not the end of the world, but it's planted pretty densely to where things are gonna grow pretty rapidly and not give a lot of space for for weeds to come in. They will, and they're already coming in, but um, there's a, a real intense um, management program uh, to keep the park looking really great. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and um, you're exactly right. We will have um, operations folks who are managing, um, you know, keeping an eye on things, making sure that everything is looking okay. And also some folks with, with an eye to horticulture too. So um, thanks, that's great. I, um, I will say, um, sorry to interrupt you, Melissa, that a lot of the species are selected to, you know, they will definitely self seed and, um, and that's a good thing. So we wanna encourage, you know, encourage the good things and, and kind of 
pluck out the bad as they as they pop up. So um, it should be a really interesting, evolving uh, landscape. Thank you. Um, we are um, towards the end of our time, um, but we have just a couple final questions um, that I wanted to get to. So we've gotten a few questions about when we're gonna open. Um, and that's a really good question. Uh, so we've been tracking, obviously, you know, the um, current state of our pandemic and we want to um, continue operating construction safely, uh, but we also wanna open at a time that is safe as well. So right now we're targeting spring of next year. And of course, as we have a better idea of how things are going in our community, we'll update everyone to let you know specifically. Um, but our hope is, you know, to, to wrap up construction as quickly as we can. And we of course wanna reopen it for the community. Um, and then one other question that we got was related to parking and how folks will be able to access the park when it's open. So um, John, do you wanna just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Melissa. And, you know, one of the things you'll notice is we didn't turn any of the park into parking. Um, and, you know, that was very intentional. Um, we have on street parking around here, but we also for, uh, you know, special events, there's a lot of garages adjacent to us. And this is a good image to see some of those, which uh, the state owns and manages, which can be a bit made available for special events, evenings, weekends, those types of things. So, you know, we are in the process of working with our neighbors on how we can access that parking and have, you know, agreements in place to use it when needed. Um, and then we have accessible parking on Red River Street um, and some additional parking uh, between on Red River Street between, you know, 12th and 11th. So it's a, it's a combination, but I'll, I'll also point out that, um, you know, we're very focused on uh, also connecting through transit, um, bike and pedestrian uh, means as well. We've been working very closely with our partners in the city and Cap Metro um, as plans for Project Connect, uh, you know, are came together and Trandy Street being one of the major corridors for that project. And then looking at how we connect uh, into the existing and constantly improving bicycle and pedestrian network um, with Red River Street being a major connection there. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of parking around us. We're going to provide access to it. And also we're connecting up with other means of transportation to get to the park and to all the areas in our community. Thanks, John. Um, and I'm gonna, I see one additional question we got and then we're gonna go ahead and close out. Um, so we got a question about um, the park um, sort of areas that will, will be closed during events or activated um, and what, what will stay open. So we will have, um, we will have certain areas um, that we could potentially gate if we have a large event or a concert, um, but we wanna keep that specific to our amphitheater space. So even if we do have a big event, we would only have um, gated points at our amphitheater and we would keep the rest of the park open. Um, so as we've been talking a lot about our garden areas, the play space, our food trucks, the family restrooms, all that will always be open. Um, and you can see where John is, is highlighting his cursor. Um, all that area is open, um, even if we have a big event. So that's something that's important to us. Um, we think events and programs are great for our community, but we also want um, folks to be able to access the park easily. Um, so with that, um, that, that concludes our, our Q&A portion. And, and if we could hop to our final slide, um, thank you again for joining us and thank you to our panelists today and our friends at DWG for joining us. Um, it's always uh, fun for us to show off the park and hear your questions. Um, and if we didn't get to it, um, you can always reach out to us if you want to visit us at waterloopgreenway.org. Um, we're happy to keep the conversation going and please keep an eye out for our next tour. Um, I do want to give a special thank you to our 2020 program sponsors, BBVA, the PAL Foundation, Susan Baum Foundation, Waterloo Sparkling Water and the Word Company. Um, they make this series possible and we're really grateful for their support. Um, and just a final, a final few plugs before we close out. Um, John mentioned our Creek Show activation. Um, if you are interested in more information, please visit waterloopgreenway.org. Um, we'll have a series of virtual programs in November and then we'll have a special light installation at Waterloo Park 
Um, in addition to that, we are also um, a proud supporter of the Frida Friday ATX market, which is going on right now. So please check out our Instagram if you're interested in more information. So with that, thank you, John. Thank you, Cassie, Kyle, and Eric. We really appreciate hearing from y'all. And have a great evening, everyone. Thank Bye. You.